even if it were effective, I wouldn't want consumers in the West to be dictating the lifestyle and, and, and even the life itself of people somewhere else. Um, don't you think that there's lack of leadership going on in the world right now on both sides, whether it's the Israelis or the Palestinians, in terms of the way they think, the way they're handling things, and also if you look at uh, international countries, Britain, like America, countries like America, the way they have handled. Um, if you look at, it, let's just say, if a smaller country, like Somalia, if they were to attack and occupy another country, you'll have in a minute you'll have the UN, all the other countries bullying that going to that country and basically you know enforcing their power mm -hmm. why is it that it's not happening in, in Palestine you, you, where you have this one side where they have big tanks with their big weapons and everything and on the other side you have a group uh, scattered all over the place lack of leadership and all we, we see is there is one power there and that power is in control, and that's Israel. That's what I see at the moment. Israel definitely has the military superiority. It has backing from the West. That's that's recognized. Everybody knows that. Uh, I would contest one thing you said, and then when you said one which is in control, what I was trying to say in my introduction that Israel is precisely today the opposite. It's in a state of lack of control. So you see, if you look at the actions of Israeli politicians over the last few years, and even a bit for, uh, behind, uh, back from that, um, they have been characterized by a lack of sense of control. Uh, Israel came into being in, a, in very unique circumstances. And in response to, if you like, a particularly European problem, it came as a result, and, or as a direct consequence, of the, at the end of World War II, uh, the Holocaust. In, uh, specifically, but it was in a sense a way of Europe to wash its hands of the com completely of the issue of anti-Semitism, the Holocaust, all that kind of thing. It was the easy solution, but it was by no means the right solution. Instead of integrating uh, Jewish Europeans into European societies, the opposite happened. They were sent away as if it's the kind of wipe over the problem and say this is not something that we have to deal with. And in that sense, Israel represented something important for the West then. It became, in the Cold War, in the, in the kind of atmosphere of the conflict of, with the Soviet Union, it became a, a, f a form of foothold in a world, in the Arab world, which could have, at any point, uh, taken the sides of the Soviets. That kind of framework starts to disappear from the, uh, the late 80s and the beginning of the 90s. And then Israel itself is in a big crisis because with the lack of the kind of the clarity of its relationship with the West, in parallel, a deterioration in what Zionism itself means. It was always about that this is a haven for Jews to be sheltered from all the problems they were facing in the past, which didn't actually play out like that. It actually instead became, in the words of a famous revolutionary, Leon Trotsky, became a bloody trap for the Jews from all over the world. So the dream of security for Jews didn't materialize. We arrive today at a, at a sense where Israeli society has this big crisis. It's generally like, it's called as uh, post-Zionism now. So there's a sense there isn't this big dream, this political idea that will unify the society and give it meaning. But at the same time, it still has the military superiority. And the problem then is, without that sense of purpose and, and without the sense that you fight wars in order to fulfill a specific political aim, Israel is becoming more and more lacking in control. And, and that's why you see this very violent eruptions. And if you look at the Palestinian government now, they might say they have a government, but really they don't have that sense of, of a structure. Their structure is breaking down. When the border was opened to Egypt, half of the population of Gaza crossed to the other side, you know, um, just to get food supplies, you know. If a government cannot provide for their people, then they're not a government really. What we are seeing is that injustice. Um, on the other side, you also have ignorant people going about blowing themselves up for the wrong reasons. Um, I think that's not going to solve anything. But the point I'm trying to make here is one has the upper hand. There is an acute sense of injustice, and I get that. 
where I'm trying to avoid falling into is this trap of uh, then just because one side is militarily stronger than the other, then they necessarily have to be looked at as victims. In my past, politically, I've been quite involved in pro-Palestinian organizations, and I still count myself as a supporter of the Palestinian cause. By no means I would go and tell a Palestinian man or woman how to dictate their, uh, kind of develop their political future or anything like that, but I consider myself a supporter of that. Unfortunately, what seems to be happening today is, whereas in the past, the Palestinian liberation movement was about self-determination. It wasn't about the appeal to anyone in the world to come and solve the situation for them. And unfortunately, this is something that's happening now. So you've, we've heard a lot of Palestinian politicians saying, how about deployment of UN troops? How about the West intervening? As you were saying, if anything happened anywhere in the world, the West would interfere. That's very problematic. If anything, the struggle between the Palestinians and the Israelis have been made compounded and made even worse because of Western intervention. It's never helped. So what I'm trying to say, it seems it's really horrific, it's really barbaric sometimes what we see on the screens, but we have to avoid the sense that, the sense of urgency that comes every couple of years from these encounters is we've forgotten about it for two years, we don't have to think about politics, we don't think about that part of the world, and then suddenly something happens and then we need a solution now. It doesn't happen like that. We need to rebuild that sense that this is a struggle for self-determination and equality. And definitely, I wouldn't say that's something that's going to be solved by, solved by the United Nations or the, or the West. If anything, we need to oppose Western intervention in there. And this is, this is more the part that we can play in our societies here in the West. So right now we've been talking about the problems a lot, but is there, I mean, to progress towards a solution, you point out that the fact Israel, or a lot of, you know, commentators saying Israel is currently lashing out right now because it feels insecure. So, I mean, what actions are there that can be taken by the international community to, you know, make it feel more secure? Or should the international community even do anything? Is this something that just Israel can only take care of domestically through the building of coalitions and, I mean, through the election of a new prime minister? Um, what can be done so there's more security in the area? I mean, that's ultimately up to Israelis themselves and up to Israeli society. And this is precisely the point that I was trying to make. And you can't write a formula for these things, and you can't ask international community to interfere in order to correct these historic problems. Uh, just think back and, 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 and look at history and see, has there ever been any instances of a sort of benign uh, uh, intervention that, that yielded results anywhere in the world. I don't, I don't think so. And I think there's always narrow political calculations that play their role. But what, what I would say for, for Israel, if you like, to arrive at this security, it needs to answer more basic questions. Can you justify in the 21st century uh, state that has very, um, if you like, ambiguous boundaries? This is the biggest problem in Israel today. Nobody knows where its boundaries are. As in, does it include the millions of Palestinians that live in the territories under their control or not? And if not, does it want to have a state only for the Jews and dismiss all these other parties or not? And I'm not saying this to say this is blame on one part or the other, but there's a nature of a society that came into being as a result of a big problem in Europe and was exported to that part of the world. And the solution now, having generations of Jews have been born in Israel, so anybody who would say the solution is to send them all back to Europe is completely deluded, and it's something I will never agree with. The solution is, how can Arabs and Jews from both sides work towards a, a state, if you like, or a form of government in which there is equality, there is a secular society in which people can practice, if you like, their religion or not any religion whatsoever, and feel equal and feel as if they're part of that society. And these are things that are not solved by the election of a prime minister. It's about, again, discovering that sense of politics, that it's not about this periodic, um, let's show strength, let's be macho about it. Um, that doesn't work. I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say you shouldn't use violence in any political cause, not at all. Violence sometimes achieves results, but it needs to be put to a specific political purpose.